Um, so I'm Patience Hagen. I'm an independent scholar and literary translator from Italian, and I'm from the US. I began this research at the European Summer University in Digital Humanities in 2018. Uh, fortunately, the instructors at that summer school were kind enough to invite me to their institution in Krakow to continue working on these questions with them. I owe an enormous debt of gratitude for this paper to Professor Mathieu Eder, Professor Jeremy Hjokab, Professor Jan Rybiski, and Professor Johanna Bischuk. Um, right now I'm presenting research in literary translator studies. I'm interested in questions of authorial and translatorial style. In this field, we hold that every author has a signature style and stylometry is the use of digital tools to measure that signature style. My work is concerned with looking at the translator's signature style as well, but a translator's style will always be enmeshed with the authors. So when we use stylometric techniques on a translated text, we are inevitably, our tools pick up both authorial and translatorial signal. So this, this poses many fascinating questions for a literary scholar or digital humanist. I believe the digital studies will be core to the future of translation studies. And I intend for this paper to contribute to the growing body of research on a translator style as a translator. So I'll start with some background on this popular series of novels, which you may already be familiar with. Elena Ferrante uh, wrote a best-selling series of novels about two friends set in Naples in the 1950s and 60s. They've been bestsellers around the world and they've been adapted as a TV series. And as you may know, Elena Ferrante, the author is an enigma because Ferrante is a pseudonym and the writer behind the books has never revealed herself or possibly himself. So naturally Ferrante's Italian texts have been the study of many stylometric studies already designed to guess who is the true author of these novels. All of that research is very fascinating, but I won't actually be addressing any of that today. Instead, my research analyzes the English translations of her books. Those translations were done by Anne Goldstein, who is probably the most famous Italian to English translator working today. So my paper will examine a 2018 English translation of Anna Maria Ortese's 1953 short story collection, Il Marino Magna Napoli, and I'll examine that book in light of the popular translations of Ferrante. I'll conclude that this translation, Neapolitan Chronicles, was strongly influenced by a desire to appeal to fans of Ferrante. So, Neapolitan Chronicles is a collection of short fiction and reportage that Ortese wrote about the blighted city she knew, Naples, Italy, in the immediate aftermath of World War II. It's written in a highly unusual style which Esther Basile described as elated, feverish, it stretches to high pitches, gives into hallucination, and in nearly every stroke on the page has something of the too much. It shows all the signs of an authentic neurosis. Elena Ferrante has cited Ortese and specifically her writings about Naples as an inspiration. When publisher New Vessel Books decided to publish The Apollon Chronicles in 2018, no doubt they are partially inspired by Ferrante's popularity. In fact, you know, as you can see on the cover on this slide, New Vessel Books uh, was quite unabashed about marketing Neapolitan Chronicles to Ferrante fans. You can see the book cover even features a quote from Ferrante, citing Adam Maria Ortese as an influence. And Anne Goldstein, the famed translator of Ferrante's work, translated this book in collaboration with another translator, Jenny McPhee. So these two translators describe in their introduction how they collaborated. Each translator initially translated one half of the book, then they swapped text and edited each other's work and their own countless times. So they write in their introduction to the book, by the end of our project, we could not have said who had written a given sentence or come up with a particular word. We had, in essence, merged into yet another translator who was at once invisible and at the same time had a style all her own. My, um, my digital humanities analysis will rely on five corpora. 
So one is Neapolitan Chronicles, translated by Anne Goldstein and Jenny McPhee. Another corpus is Anne Goldstein's nine translation of Ferrante novels. This includes the four novels that make up the best-selling series. Another corpus is six English translation of Ortese's fiction by translators other than Ferrante and, Go and McPhee. Another corpus is 23 of Goldstein's solo fiction translations from Italian. And finally, Jenny McPhee's three solo fiction translations from Italian. So in this research, I'm using stylometric methods that have been developed to determine the authorship of a disputed text. And I'm using these methods to address two particular research questions here. One is, is the style of Neapolitan Chronicles more like Ortese or more like Ferrante? And the other is, is the style of Neapolitan Chronicles more like the style of one of its translators, either Anne Goldstein or Jenny McPhee? So first I'll discuss how I compared Neapolitan Chronicles to English translations of Ortese and Ferrante. And then second, I'll discuss how I compared Neapolitan Chronicles to solo translations by Anne Goldstein and solo translations by Jenny McPhee. I'll say a few words to explain the stylometric approach I'm taking. So my computational analysis relies on a, on a code library for stylometry, which is written in the programming language R. It includes scripts that can analyze a text and compute the frequency of every word in it. To discuss an author's style, Stylometrists can look at our lists of look at lists of an author's most frequent words. An author's individual preferences for certain function words, such as conjunctions, articles, prepositions, and pronouns, uh, can kind of characterize an author's individual style. There are also content words. Those are words that pertain to the book's topic. Content words are actually a much weaker indicator of an author's unique style and a weaker clue in authorship disputes. Um, in fact, our brains are kind of hardwired not to notice function words, but those are the words that really give away an author's hand and can reveal a lot about the person who uses them. When we write or speak, we actually use function words much, much more often than content words. See this quotation from social psychologist and language expert, James Pennebaker. Function words account for less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of your vocabulary, but make up almost 60% of the words you use. Stylometrists often rely on patterns in an author's most frequent words, and particularly in an author's function words, to resolve authorship mysteries. So in carrying out this analysis, I'm using tools that were developed to resolve authorship disputes. I'm looking at these authors and these translators' use of function words to talk about you know, whose style is dominant here. These are some results from using the Stylo library to compare these texts these texts. This is a bootstrap consensus tree that plots texts based on the similarity of their most frequent words. Neapolitan Chronicles is the text whose title appears in green. All of the Ferrante texts appear in red. So as you can see, this tree plots Neapolitan Chronicles right in the midst of, of Goldstein's translations of Ferrante. This speaks to how similar the book style is to Goldstein's Ferrante translations had this analysis you know, found the style to be quite different from Ferrante's, it, it would have placed Neapolitan Chronicles separate from the Ferrante translation. Another tool I'll use from the Stylo library is the oppose function. This is used to compare the style of two texts. You run the oppose function on two texts and it'll tell you the words that are most unique to each one. How does this function determine which words are most unique? It relies on a method called Craig's Zeta. So I, I'll just want to give a very brief explanation of how it works. This method divides the text into passages of 5,000 words each. Then for each text, the method counts up how many sections of that author's text contain a given word. This ignores the word's frequencies and it just concentrates on how consistently they appear. So it, the result is kind of telling you in what percentage of the passages each word appears. Then the method considers how many of text A's sections include the word compared to how many of text B's sections exclude that word. 
And this is used to calculate a numerical score for each word's distinctiveness. Here are the results from using the oppose function to compare Ferrante's Neapolitan novels to Ortiz's Neapolitan chronicles. So what you see on this chart is the 70 most distinctive words for each corpus. On the left are the words most unique to Ferrante. On the right are the words most unique to Ortiz. Their distance to the right or the left is based on the zeta score of how distinctive they are. These scores can range from zero to two. So a score of two would mean that the word is found in every single section of one text and no sections of the other. In this particular comparison, the most distinctive words are approaching scores of one. Here's what's um, notable about these lists is that they're full of what stylometrists call content words rather than function words. You'll notice that the word most unique to Ferrante is Lila. That's the name of a character in her books. There are a lot of characters' names on this list, and there are a lot of words that relate to the actions that take place in the respective books. So even if you haven't read these books, you can look down these lists and probably make some guesses about the book's content. Uh, many of the words most unique to Ferrante are about school or family, or they're verbs about people threatening each other or being afraid. On the other hand, many of the words most unique to Ortese drop hints about how much of her book is concerned with uh, kind of visual description. Because her list has a lot of nouns that are used to describe a cityscape, like walls, crowd, balconies, and floor. Um, and it has a lot of adjectives that you'd use to describe a blighted city, like melancholy, pale, gray, vast, so typically when you compare two different authors, you would not see a list dominated by content words at all. You would see it dominated by function words, or at the very least, you'd see a lot more function words than you see on this list. So what this means is that, you know, this analysis is telling us these English translations of Artese and Ferrante use function words in very similar patterns. Um, and it's suggesting that the, uh, the authorial style of both is quite similar. Next, I used a stylometric test called a rolling classifier to compare Neapolitan Chronicles to Ortese's work and Ferrante's work. This classifier is trained to recognize the most frequent words in two sets of corpora. One is English translations of Ferrante and one is English translations of Ortese. The classifier cuts the text up into 5,000 word segments and then analyzes each segment individually. For each segment, the classifier determines whether the style is more like Ferrante or more like Ortese, and it makes a guess as to the authorship of each of these 5,000 word passages. This is the result of the rolling classifier. So in this chart is the horizontal stripe labeled first, that would be the third stripe down. This is the classifier's first guess about the authorship of each 5,000 word passage. And the, the stripes labeled second and third are the classifier's second and third guesses about the authorship. So for passages that the classifier guesses are Ferrante, this chart has colored them in red. If for passages that the classifier guesses are Ortese, this chart has colored them in green. And as you can see, the rolling classifier classified nearly all of Neapolitan Chronicles as more stylometrically similar to, Fer to Ferrante works. And it only classified one short story as similar to Ortese work. That's a, the short story, The Gold of Forcella. And this story focuses on the abject poverty of a neighborhood in Naples. And it is the most unique one in, its, in terms of its original style. This chart shows the results of a rolling classifier, which was used to compare Neapolitan Chronicles to solo translations by Anne Goldstein and solo translations by Jenny McPhee. So in this chart, passages classified as Goldstein are in red, and it would show classified passages, passages classified as Jenny McPhee in green, but you'll notice there's no green on this chart at all. So this classifier classified all parts of the book as more like Goldstein's translations. I mean, these results, they support Goldstein and McPhee's claim to have merged into 
a single translator with a coherent style throughout the book. Yet they don't support the claim that this translator had a style all her own. Rather, this blended translator possesses the same style that Goldstein used in her translations of Ferrante. So by now I've shown you that several digital texts have determined that Neapolitan Chronicles is stylistically similar to Anne Goldstein's translations of Elena Ferrante. But I haven't told you um, in literary terms how they're similar. So I'm gonna just briefly go over some of the stylistic features that Neapolitan Chronicles shares with Goldstein's Ferrante translations. And this, this is the result of old fashioned qualitative analysis. Neapolitan Chronicles preserves Ortese's long sentences, just like Goldstein's translations of Ferrante. So as many people here probably know, Italian fiction tends to contain longer sentences than fiction written in English. So Italian to English translators typically shorten these sentences, often breaking them apart into a greater number of sentences. And Goldstein, for the most part, doesn't break the sentences up. Goldstein also tends to preserve gerunds and often uses them in a very Italian way. Um, and she frequently preserves Italian idioms from the original text by just calcing them into English word for word. Here are my conclusions. First, the style of Neapolitan Chronicles is more like Goldstein's Ferrante than it is like any, in, any other English translations of Ortese. Goldstein and McPhee essentially Ferrantized Ortese's work to appeal to Ferrante fans. They subdued the unique feverish style of the original stories. Second, Goldstein and McPhee's blended translator doesn't have a style all her own. The pair essentially adopted the style that Goldstein used for Ferrante translations. This slide lists my key sources for the stylo stylometric methods I've used in this paper. Just wanted to share that with you. And thank you so much for letting me present. So I'd love to hear any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Patience. It was really, very fascinating. And you have questions. Uh, the first one is, um, is there another way to examine style? I've heard of Tetrapla and Sketch Engine for comparing interim drafts in my project, but have not yet explored them. Uh, I've never heard of R. Yeah, and the style material you used. So that's all right. That's fascinating. I know there are other ways to examine it. And thank you for telling me those two because I hadn't heard of them at all. I've only really experimented with um, with stylometry and R. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're interested in the topic, uh, I found that some of the most the best resources on this almost are stylometric studies that have been done on Elena Ferrante because. Uh, her identity is a mystery. Uh, and there's been some really interesting research comparing her style to the style of well-known Italian authors uh, and using different methods, not all of them using R. So I would, I, yeah, I wish I could tell you more methods, but I'd go to one of those papers and, and look for that research. Uh, I know that there was done, uh, a stylometry was done on Good Omens, which was written by Terry Pratchett and uh, Neil Gaiman. But I don't know which method, which um, uh, uh, of these were, was used. Uh, perhaps James knows, but I'm not sure of that. Um, anyway, you have another. Uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, you have no more questions. Uh, I think all the others uh, go. Yeah. So. <clears throat> all right, thank you so much. Yes. Then. <laughs> Still. Um, I, I guess uh, um, Anne Goldstein style was so, uh, so much stronger than Jenny McPhee's in, in the, the collaborative translation. Uh, does it mean that she is much more experienced or it's just her personality? Uh, what, what do you think? Why, why her style was uh, so detectable? That's, that would be a really interesting question to unpack. I'm guessing to really consider those things, you'd have to hear from the two translators um, directly. They, they'd have to kind of cooperate to tell you. I, I'm guessing if 
just my opinion. I'm guessing it had a lot to do with her experience because she had a lot more experience than McPhee. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of maybe a, a desire, whether conscious or not, to make this sound like Ferrante mm -hmm. because it's, it's uh, another like enigmatic woman from Naples, Italy, um, kind of writing about the same time period. I think they just, whether they consciously did it or not, I think they, they, they had this kind of desire to make it sound like her. So it, it's, it sounds a lot like, it sounds a lot like Goldstein, but specifically like the gold, the voice that Goldstein adopted for Ferrante. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, meanwhile, you got a uh, question the, um, from Maria Jo, uh, who hadn't heard of this method before and could be very useful to uh, her own research analyzing punctuation. Uh, and she asked, do you know it has been used to analyze punctuation marks or only words? That's fascinating. I, um, so the library that I use, it like deliberately kind of filters out the punctuation marks and doesn't consider them. Um, I, I think I can see how it would be technically possible to include the punctuation marks as well, but it might take some, um, it might take some modifications to this library. But I, I think it's definitely possible. I don't, I don't know if it has been used that way yet. But great idea. Okay. Uh, um, may I ask some, something? Because it also crossed my mind that um, Goldstein's um, translatory style might be uh, caused by another um, thing. Some of the literary translators have such a strong style, uh, such a strong voice on their own, uh, that they always translate everything into their own style, uh, regardless of the original. So per, um, uh, do you intend to compare other Goldstein translations, not just the translations of Ferranta, but other, uh, whatever she may translate it into English, uh, and check whether her voice is always the same or... Yes, I'm thinking of doing exactly that. That's a, that's exactly a question I want to explore. Um, I think it's a really fascinating question, and these um, the academics in Poland who created this library have have done that experiment too on other translators with some really fascinating results. Like sometimes you see that for some translators, you know, they're you can really see the effect of their own personal style. And sometimes you can't. Uh, I'd love to keep exploring that on Goldstein and other prolific translators from Italian. And also, um, if the translator has a very, very um, individual, very unique style, then people sometimes recognize it immediately and, and buy the translation because, because they know that, uh, what they uh, could expect from the translator. So perhaps Goldstein is a, a literary translator of that style or that kind. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I ne never uh, had a look at the, the English translation, so uh, no idea. Fine. Uh, any other questions? No. I think there might be two more. Um, from Ruth, uh, given the fact that the vast majority of published book translations go through a copy editing process and probably also a separate proofreading process, how do you attribute particular word choices specifically to the translator as to the post to the copy editor or even the proofreader, mm -hmm. which is a terrific point, but I, I have no idea how you, I could ever break that out. I feel like that's, that's kind of a huge conundrum in, in this kind of study is all of these books have been through that process. We, I feel like we just kind of attribute everything to the author because we can't really know unless you, unless you have like, the editorial archive and you have all the letters and the drafts, uh, which I certainly don't in this case. Um, yeah, I've, in this case, I'm only working with the finished text, but that, that's an absolutely fascinating style. If you're ever working on a text where you had um, all of the drafts to consider, I think it would be interesting to, to see the hand of each editor, every person who worked on it. Uh, and the other question? Um... Uh, that in case the translators had indeed been successful in creating a third virtual translator, what would be the expected result in the role in comparison? That is a really interesting question. And I um, I wish I'd like seen a chart that showed that kind of situation, but I never have. My guess is it would be like 
the guesses for the voice would be a lot more random. Like it would be sometimes guessing translator A and sometimes guessing translator B because it would be it would be so confused about um, about who the person was. But that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think I, I can show you the good omens phylometry uh, there, there you can see the, the, uh, the parts which uh, it, it's not a translation it was written by two writers but exactly the same happens that you have the, the red bits and the, the green ones um, so I think it, this would be the expected result uh, mm -hmm. if, if they perhaps if they, they uh, translated without uh, creating the, the virtual translator and since they they collaborated so closely. Now they have only one voice. Unfortunately, that's not the third one, but Goldstein's. Yeah? Yeah. That's yeah. very interesting. Okay. And another question. Um, do you think that the gender has an effect on the translation? Does being man or woman will change something? I, uh, I, yeah, I absolutely believe it does. And the counter, this new one kind of read my mind because I, I'm presenting another paper later today where I'm, I'm going to engage with that topic. But I absolutely think it does. And that's, I think, a really interesting area where research is being done. OK, and uh, finally, uh, in my doctoral project, I have the first four drafts produced by the literary translator. And we'll see the published novel in July 2022, having followed the translator in her process remotely last year. There is huge potential for exploring these texts. So perhaps it's, uh, this is a thanks to, uh, for giving such a good idea uh, to Barbara. Yeah. All right. Great. I, I tell um, them, and check out this R Stylo library. I'm, I can probably find a link to it and drop it in. Yeah. 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 So you give inspiration to others. That's lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, talk.